Let's take a seat. All right. Well, that was nice. You guys got quiet quick. I like that. Let's do this. So we have our Olympic Games outside in between services, and it's the greatest thing ever. I love watching the, the kids participate in our own Bridge Church Olympic Games. Last week we did have the cartwheel competition. Did anybody see that one? Anybody see the cartwheel competition? Did anybody see our worship leader, Dina, fall? Anybody see that? That was pretty good. That was good. We had kids win gold, silver, and bronze medals. And it was great because some of the kids were so mad about placing at bronze that they even cried. And to me, it was just like the Olympics. So we're doing a good job here at the Bridge Church. That's all I know. Now today, please go support the kids. We do have the marshmallow relay, and it's pretty funny. Now... To companion that fun outside, we started a summer series called Game Changers, where we're looking at how the Apostle Paul used sports metaphors in the letters to the Corinthians as a way to communicate spiritual truths. Because the Olympic Games were very prominent and popular back then as they are today. Last week, we looked at some of Paul's terminology when he used words like running and races and prizes and competing in games, strict training and boxers punching. Today, we're going to talk about something that goes beyond the gold medals, something that goes beyond just the prize. We're going to talk about the process, the middle of it, what that looks like in the middle of what's happening in your life. So let me introduce you to this idea that I'm guessing a lot of you may be able to relate to. How many of you have ever lived under the illusion that there's something out there that's coming that's, that really, really matters and it matters more than you're doing right now? Like when I get that, then my life is going to be good. When I have this, then I can finally be comfortable in my life. When this happens, then my life will fully start. It's that thing that you desire. It's the event that you're looking for. It's that something that you think is going to bring you meaning and fulfillment and something you've been looking for for such a long time. It's not here yet, but it's somewhere out there. Let me give you an example. I have been a musician all of my life. And I used to think when I was younger, all right, I play guitar pretty okay. And if I can just get into a band, then I will be a legit musician. I'll be a real musician. And then I got into a horrible band, okay? And I thought, if I can just get into a good band, then music will be real. I'll be like a real musician. And then, of course, it just keeps changing. Okay, if I can get this band on the road and tour, then I will be a real musician. And that, of course, that morphed into if I can get signed to a label and start getting paid to play music, then I'm a real musician. Then I'm really doing it. And then looking back, I think, you barely need to play an instrument to call yourself a musician. And then even looking back further than that, I'm like, you can really just sit your lazy behind on a couch with a guitar on you and say, I'm a musician, and everyone's going to agree. I already was a musician. This happens in ministry in my life too. Once I finish school, then my ministry is going to begin. That's when it's going to start. Okay, once I really start teaching the youth, that's when my ministry begins. No, when I become an associate pastor and start teaching adults, that's when my ministry will begin. Oh, no, no. When I get my own place, then, then I can start doing my own things. That's when my ministry is really going to start. And I know God's just sitting there going, what a doofus, all right? Like your ministry is already going, so it's already going. You're doing it. You're living it. It's not somewhere in the future. Ministry is now. Amen. And then think of the Olympians. They train their whole lives for this moment coming up at the end of this month. They, they train their whole lives, hours, days, months, years are dedicated to their sport. 
And quite often, I've been doing a lot of research on Olympians lately, and their identity is linked with their athletic ability. If I could just get to the Olympics, then I've made it. If I can just get on that podium, then I've made it. If I can just get that gold, then I know for sure that I've made it. And many of these athletes have what they call this post-Olympic experience after. It's not good. Some are so dissatisfied with how they performed, they experience long-term psychological distress as a result. And even if the Olympians do well, the rise and fall of this Olympic celebrity that they're going to go into right now is something that they struggle to handle, to even know what to do next. And for those who don't make it in the Olympics or don't make it in the sport afterwards, they have to go back to work just like the rest of us. And everyday tasks just aren't as exciting. Even this two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, my kids were watching the Disney movie Tangled that has Rapunzel in it. Has anybody seen Tangled before? Well, there's a song in there that says, when will my life begin? And it's the whole song. When will my life begin? When will it begin? When I get the, the prince or the princess or waiting for that, that thing. And you're being indoctrinated right from the very beginning that right now isn't good enough. That we need to be somewhere else. It's somewhere in the future is when our life is going to begin, when you're a real musician, when your ministry begins. And what I have found is whatever season I have been in, I'm always kind of wishing that current season away and just waiting for the next one to come in. One day around the corner, that achievement, that accomplishment, that friendship, that possession, there's going to be something that fills the emptiness inside, right? Right? But right around every corner, there's just another challenge. There's just another goal or another problem or another vision or another dream or another perceived prize. And there's a verse that I want us to anchor to this morning. And it's from the Apostle Paul. We're still in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says this. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Simple and yet profound. To give you some context, the Corinthian Christians were having issues with eating food that had been sacrificed to idols. And Paul steps in and he emphasizes the need for believers and for us today to be mindful of the impact of our actions on others and ourselves. But most importantly, we need to prioritize the glory of God above all else. That's what's most important. Everything that you do in your life, even the mundane things like eating and drinking, he says do it all for the glory of God. Do it all. It, whatever you do, if you're doing laundry, if you're picking up kids from their sporting events, if you're running errands for your boss, if you're doing something that even isn't that big of a deal, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And when I look in my life in the past, if I'm being really honest with you, whatever I did, I was mostly doing for me. You know, I want to do this so I can be happy. I want to do what makes me feel good. I want to do what's going to fulfill my dreams. I want to do what fulfills my wants and, and my desires. I want to do what I want to do. I didn't even understand doing it for the glory of God. I was doing it for my Glory. In fact, I looked up some past slogans from the Olympics in pr previous years and how they use this term glory. I found chasing glory. I found for glory, for honor, for gold. It doesn't work. It's shallow. It's very surface stuff. But this is how a lot of us live our lives. And yet as Jesus followers, as believers... Jesus says that we are to deny ourselves. See, that's different than what the world is telling us. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you don't do it for your glory. You don't do it for your honor or for your gold. He said, you do it to be a disciple of mine. You don't indulge in yourself. You deny yourself and you do things for the glory of God. He says, whatever you do to really have meaning in life, do it for the glory of God. 
and you do it today. You do it right now. Even in the mundane, even in normal routine stuff on a Sunday, you do it now for the glory of God. You see, the prize isn't out there somewhere. The prize isn't what you accomplish occasionally. The prize is what you do daily and is for the Lord, for the glory of God. I want to say that again because I really want that to sink in. The prize isn't out there somewhere else, something you do occasionally. It's not, I got the raise, I got the car, I got the TV. The prize is what you do daily and you do it for the glory of God. And now think about this. What if the work is the reward? What if the prize is the process, the, the name of this sermon? What if whatever you do, you can find meaning and fulfillment and divine satisfaction because you're doing it for something beyond yourself, for the glory of God? Now let me show you in the next text in Corinthians how Paul lived this out and how he lived this way. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10 reads, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I, was, I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. The grace of God, I am what I am. I am what I am. And for many of you, that's your story. You weren't good enough. You weren't faithful. You weren't always righteous. But by the grace of God... You are now what you are, not because you're good, not because of that, because he is good. And now you are becoming what he wants you to be because his glory and his grace for your life. And Paul says, I worked harder than all of them. And before you throw your preconceived notions into what Paul is saying, oh, he's bragging, what, he works so hard, get over yourself, Paul. Right, when I first read that, I thought, ew, conceited? What are you doing? I don't think Paul is bragging here. I don't think Paul is complaining here. I think he is stating the truth. He is stating the facts. By the grace of God, I just worked harder. I have been so transformed by Jesus, Paul saying that because of who he is and what Jesus did, I just got to work. Whatever I did, I did it for his glory. I worked harder than all of them. Not because I'm any good, but because God transformed me. All because of who Jesus is and for what he did. I worked that hard. And listen, I can't even imagine the depths of sacrifices that the apostle Paul endured. He went through a lot. He did work harder. And it goes through it in 2 Corinthians and in chapter 11. He goes through this list of things that happened to him and the sacrifices he made. And I, I want to sum it up to you because I imagine Paul just writing this to, to, to the Corinthians or he's just telling other people like, okay, I am not bragging, I am not complaining, but I was beaten again and again and again and I got back up. I had to go on. I had to keep working. You know why others went to bed? I, I, I labored and I toiled and I went without sleep just praying and strategizing. That's what God's word tells us. He said, I have been harassed by robbers over and over again. I have been in danger from the country to the cities, from the rivers to the seas. And I keep going. I keep grinding, grinding and working all for the glory of God. I was even shipwrecked. And I just moved on. I had to keep going. One time I was even bitten by a poisonous snake. That's right. I didn't like that. But I shook that thing off and I just kept going. While others took a shortcut, I always try to do the right thing. You know, I was in prison and I just kept working. I kept grinding. I served Jesus even when, it was in, even when I was in prison. We went into cities that had no Christians and we managed to start churches with Christians. We led people to Christ. We led this person to Christ, this person to Christ. We'd raise up leaders. We didn't even have a lot of resources and yet we got the job done. I know that's what he means when he says, I worked harder than all of them. And when you look at what Paul is saying, Paul is never wishing his current season away. Never. He is in it. Wherever he was, he was all there. Wherever he was, Paul was all in. Whatever he did, he was doing it for the glory of God. When he was in prison, 
He didn't say, one day, when I am finally out of prison, then I can get back to doing what I'm called to do. Then I can get back to ministry. No, he said, whatever I do, I do it for the glory of God. If there is someone chained up next to me, I will be a witness to that person right now. He says, give me a pen. Give me some paper. I'm going to write to some other churches because they need it. I don't care if I'm in prison. I'm going to do whatever I have to do for the glory of God. When he was shipwrecked, you know what he didn't say? He didn't say, well, God, you let me down again. I mean, I prayed for protection on this trip, and here I am. I am shipwrecked. He's like, you know what? We didn't die, so we might as well keep on going. God must still be with us. He must still be working. Whenever his friend Barnabas turned on him, he didn't go, I can't take it anymore, Christians. Just can't trust these guys. I am leaving this Sunday school because Barnabas hurt my feelings. I'm out. No, he said, you know what? I don't have time for this. I am going to keep on going. I'm not going to get bitter. We still have work to do because whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it for the glory of God. And I don't know how that applies to your life, but if you're out there changing diapers, if you're out there making sales calls, if you're out there doing laundry, if you're doing something for your boss that you don't even like, if you can just say, in this moment, at this time, even though it might not be incredibly attractive uh, from the outside, I'm going to do this thing with integrity. I'm going to do this thing with some pure heart and, and heart of a servant. And I'm declaring right now, this task is for the glory of God. That easy. Period. Done. And when you live that way, suddenly you will start to realize, wow, maybe, maybe the work is the reward. Maybe the prize is the process. Now let me show you three enemies of that process. Let me show you three enemies of that true reward that we all struggle with. Every single one of us in here struggle with one of these things. The first one is what I'm going to say is the seduction of comfort. That's right. We want to be comfortable. We are not comfortable with being uncomfortable. I'm not. I struggle. All of us in Western society and in America, we got first world problems all the time. All of us. And this is, you know, if I was just the boss or if I had this position at work, then I would make enough money to be comfortable. No, you won't. No, you won't. Because problems come. You've heard the saying, mo money, mo problems, right? It is true. It is true. As soon as you get that extra $200 on your checks a month, your car is going to break down. Then you have to get a $400 car payment. This is what happens. I could give you way more examples, but this is the stuff that always takes place. There's always going to be a problem. Maybe you thought whatever it is, fill in the blank. If I don't have walk-in closets, you want walk-in closets. If you don't have granite countertops, I need granite countertops to be comfortable. If I have only one shower head, I need two shower heads, then I really have the high class, the water pouring down here and here. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? The two shower head issue thing that people like? Is anybody in here like taking baths? Anybody a bath taker in this room? Anybody that says, yep, man, that's crazy, that's... I can't take baths. I'm like 6'1". I just don't fit. Paul, do you fit in baths? We don't fit in baths, man. It doesn't work. It's really hard. It's very difficult. Now, last week, just this last week, I was in this very comfortable place, the seduction of comfort. I was in Montana at this beautiful lake house, this, this, these beautiful views and this beautiful company, and everything is aimed towards just being comfortable and relaxed and serene and calming but get this, the guest bedroom that we stayed in, not only did it not have a two-headed shower, it only had a bath. <laughs> Phyllis, I love you. I love you, Phyllis. I know I'm using you as an example. That's who we stayed with. You know the last time I took a bath? Last year when I was in Montana. <laughs> and I tell Nicole, you know, if only this place had a shower, then we could be comfortable. Are you serious? Go take a bath, you ungrateful lump. Just take a bath. Why do you have to be comfortable with everything you do? We are so fascinated as a society with, with being comfortable. We're obsessed with it. I just need this to be comfortable. I just want that to be comfortable. We want the reward. We don't want the struggle. We want the result. We don't want the process. 
We want the victory. We don't want the fight. But life doesn't work out that way. It doesn't. Life is not about always being comfortable. And I hope and I pray that you understand that God, God never called us to easy. Never. He called us to deny ourselves. I just told you that. Jesus said deny yourself. Easy never changed the world, ever. So don't get tricked by the seduction of comfort. Always have to be comfortable. Next one, the allure of distraction. Ah, distraction in our current day and age. This one is a tough one. There's so many distractions. Now this one is, I, I, I have this really important thing to do today. I have this really important thing to do in the next hour, and then ding, you get a notification on your phone. Oh my gosh, I wonder what she just posted on Facebook. I need to go look. I need to see what she posted on Facebook. And the next thing you know, you are distracted for hours on social media or something. It's not worth it. Not worth it. Netflix. Hey, I like binging Netflix. We all like binging Netflix shows. Nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, is if you only binge Netflix shows, that's a distraction. If all you do is that, that's a problem. Because I know Netflix is smart, man. They'll put the next show is recommended and it says like 99% chance I'm going to like it. And I'm like, this must be the will of God then. I must watch this, ne this next Netflix show. Distraction. Distractions are everywhere. So we have seduction of comfort. We have distraction that gets us away from the prize of the process. Lastly, the temptation to quit. We are in a generation of, I quit, I'm done. When the marriage gets difficult, not love anymore, this isn't worth it, I quit. Trying to get your finances together, you become weak. I'm hungry, let's go out to eat. It's like $200 for a family of four. I quit. I can't handle this debt. Christianity, I can't even tell you how many times I've heard some version of this. Well, I tried, God. I tried. You know, I went to church twice. I read my Bible for that day, you know, and when I walked into church, that one person didn't even say hi to me today. I'm out of here. I quit. Listen, when you feel like quitting, if whatever horrible or mundane thing you're going through at this moment, if you're doing it for the glory of God, you won't quit. You won't even feel a need to quit because you realize, man, the prize is right now. The work is the reward. This is amazing. Then you realize quitting is not even op an option because you realize there's something bigger and more purposeful for your life. You can find passion and purpose in the mundane and, and even the horrible. Like Paul was telling us, if you do it for the glory of God. See, purpose helps us find passion within ordinary things. Think about the Apostle Paul for a moment. That guy had to be passionate about something. He had to be. I mean... This is just going to be a fun thought experiment. I was trying to think of some outlandish things the Apostle Paul could be passionate about. He's human. He had to be passionate about something. So I thought maybe the Apostle Paul was this shredding guitar player, okay? Maybe that was his passion, just music, just shredding. Maybe his passion and his dreams were to rock out across stages in Greece, right? He just wants to go on tour with his band, the Philippian Funksters. The Resurrection Rhythms, the Galatian Groovers, I could keep going. I have more for the next service, just so you know. I have more. He was a regular person, just like you and I. I don't know what his human passions were, but maybe he was saying, this is what I need to be happy. This is what I need to, to be feeling accomplished in my life. Whatever it was, Paul had his own passions. There had to be real things in that guy that he was excited about. What he was not passionate about, let me promise you this, was getting beaten and left for dead over and over and over again. He was not passionate about that. I promise you, there was never a time where he's saying, oh man, to be shipwrecked and to be bit 
by that poisonous snake, man, and left for dead. If I can only do that, then I would be happy. Paul wasn't saying that. Instead of pushing and pursuing selfish passions and, and selfish pursuits, what he did is he pursued God's purpose. And suddenly, he would say things like this. This is from Acts. He said, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race. There's some more sports metaphors. And complete the task the Lord has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Finish the race. That was Paul's aim to finish the race. Last week we talked about Jesus' race. This week the Apostle Paul, he just wants to complete the task the Lord gave him. So I want to ask you, what task has the Lord given to you today in your life? What purpose does the Lord have for your life? Really think about it. you got to know what it is. Like find that task. Figure out the purpose that God has for your life. Maybe some of you today, maybe it's you can experience the task of just serving. Just, just serving. Maybe you can find joy by simply making someone coffee today. That's it. Maybe you're in Kids Bridge in the next service and you're helping the kids carry marshmallows in their mouth for some relay that the dumb pastor has you doing in between services. Maybe. Whatever seems ordinary becomes extraordinary when you do it for God. Every single time. Because it's not just a task. It's a purpose-directed thing by God. I, I want you to imagine something. When I wake up, God, today it's your day. This is the day the Lord has made. It's your day. Whatever I do, whether it seems big and, and, and gigantic in my life and exciting or small and insignificant, God, I am choosing to find purpose in this right now. I'm going to do it all for your glory. I'm not running around aimlessly like a guy just running. I am running with purpose in every single step that I take. I am directed by your Spirit. I am empowered by your word. That's how I move. I am loving people wherever I go. When I walk into a room, the spirit of God walks in the room with me. That's how I'm living my life. I am a people lover. I, I want to lift the moods of people. When I come into a dark room, I'm bringing the light of Jesus into that room wherever I go. There is nowhere that I go that I don't have purpose because I go with the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the spirit that's dwelling within me. That's the day that I have. I don't care how bad the day gets, that's my day because whatever I do, I'm doing it for the one who changed my life, who has completely transformed me. Whatever you do this week, wherever, if you're just driving kids around to and fro, you're doing it for the glory of God. If you're prepping for grad school, do it for the glory of God. If you're fighting to hold on to your marriage do it with purpose in every step for the glory of God. Whether you're crying with your spouse because you want to conceive and you can't conceive, whether you're, you're, just, you're just carrying, you're carrying all this weight on your shoulders. Maybe you're taking care of aging parents. Maybe you feel like you're called to do something more than the job that you're stuck at. Maybe you're healing from crushing disappointment. Maybe you're battling cancer. Maybe you're trying to pay down debt. Whatever you're doing, do it for the glory of God. And you have purpose in this moment right now. The prize is not the promotion. The prize is not the new car. The prize is not the five-year dream that has to all come together for you to be happy and for you to discover your true purpose. No, the prize is right now. The prize is here. This is the day the Lord has made. And because of the grace of God, I will rejoice in it and be glad in it. That's what God's word tells us. And if you live selflessly like that, you become extravagant in your giving. You become extravagant in your love. You become extravagant in your forgiveness. You become extravagant in everything you do. And one day you will wake up in the middle of the mundane. Maybe that's today. In the middle of the normal and you say, God, I have experienced you here. And I am full of your goodness. And I am overflowing with your joy. Because I have discovered that the work is the reward. I'm doing it right now. And it's a joy to serve you no matter how bad it gets. It's my joy to have this sacrifice for your kingdom. Because I'm doing it for something bigger. 
I live to be with you, become like you, and do as you did. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Please stand with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now to say thank you for your life. Thank you for your purpose. And thank you for bringing us together to get into your word and to see how to live like you did. I want to pray for anyone in this room right now that is struggling to find purpose, struggling to find their passion. And Lord, I know there's people in here right now that feel like they are just in the middle of the mundane and the ordinary. They feel like they're in the middle of a, a process that they just need out of. Lord, I pray that when they go to work tomorrow or they leave church here today and they sit maybe in traffic or have a bad day or a good day, that they do it all for your glory. That they really heed the words that I do this all for the glory of God no matter what it is. As we go out of this room today, I hope that we can, and I hope and I pray that we can all be these believing Christians that when we walk out, we do it for the glory of God. I don't care how good it looks, how bad it looks from the outside. It's all about you. It's not about us. I want to pray for anyone in here that struggles with wanting to be comfortable. I know all of us struggle with that. I struggle with that. Lord, help us be comfortable with the uncomfortable. We're never called just to be comfortable. We're called to be uh, uh, this, this hope to the world through you. We're called to be the light of the world to you. And this world is dark. It is hard to be a light in this world, but through you, we can do anything. Be with those in this room that just want to quit. Either quit what's going on in their lives or just quit their lives altogether. Lord, lift them up and encourage them right now. There is more. There is more to it than what you're seeing right now. If that's how you're feeling that you want to quit, don't. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. There is purpose for your life. You are breathing right now for a purpose. And that purpose is to glorify God. And when you do that, when you see that, when you feel that, you won't want to quit anymore. Lord, I thank you for our church. I thank you for our community that we get to witness to. And I thank you for this coming VBS this coming summer blast that we get to reach children, that we get to reach the kids and show them your love and to show them there's more, there's purpose, there's passion in this life and there's more than just ourselves. In Jesus Christ's name we all pray, amen. Praise band, come on up for our, our closing song. We're gonna be passing out our tithing baskets right now. Thank you for always being so generous here. We have now officially collected $3,000, our goal for our summer blast. Yes, let's give us a round of applause. And that money is going to go to bless these kids. It's going to go to blessing this community and, and just bringing the kids in and showing them the love of God and the word of God. So I'm very, very excited that we all came together as, as, as a body and said we are going to support this, but we can't stop here. We have to keep doing this. We have to keep doing this together to reach our community for Christ. What are we doing this for? The glory of God, just like Paul said today. If you need prayer, we have our prayer team ready to go. They have lanyards on. They'll be up front. They can pray over you. And please go support the kids out there. You can laugh with them, laugh at them while they carry around marshmallows. It's going to be a blast. Have a great rest of your Sunday. God bless. Jesus.
to this week that it's all for the glory of God. God bless you.